I just had to hit the record button like 15 times and nothing happened. I don't know what that's about. You gonna run from the camera? I know, you're all full of it right now. She slept all day. <laughs> Speaking of sleeping, hey, what's up garden friends? Jeff, your tropical plant party, how's everybody doing? I hope you're good, I am great. I am trying to get this sensor set up here for the grow space. Giving me just a little bit of trouble. The display on here just wasn't really showing anything. It came supplied with batteries. I should probably actually focus on like introducing the vlog. No plans this week. Probably play around with some plants. There's a lot of work that needs to be done outside. But anyways, I got this new sensor because there's the one that I've been using, which I showed in a vlog a while, was just a disc. You'll see it again here in a few minutes probably. And I like that one, but it doesn't have a display on it. And I don't always wanna to have to open my phone to see what's going on. So I got this other one that hooks up to the same app that has a display and a little stand thing that it sits in here. Back to where I was before. The display was just like real crummy. It wasn't showing anything. Like you could kind of see what it said, but not really. And it came with batteries, which is so nice. How often does that happen? This is the tab that pulled out from there, this little tab, which meant that only one of the batteries was covered that entire time. Like that would have had to cover all of these points for that to be effective. So I'm thinking, hoping that this just needs new batteries. Yes, that makes sense to me. So far, I've really liked all these products I've been getting from Govee, and really, I don't think I've ever used one of these like Wi-Fi smart sensor devices and had many issues with them. They all seem to work fairly well. But one thing I just don't understand is why the ones that cost more don't have rechargeable batteries on. You see that? Look at that display. So that's still pretty crummy. I think I might just need to send this back. That doesn't look as bad on camera, but in person, it has to be at like just the right angle to be able to see it. These are brand new batteries, so uh, I'm, I don't know, I'll give it a little while. It is really cold outside. This just came in the mail, so like maybe it needs to warm up. I don't know if that's really how this works, but I'll give it a little while. But now I have three different sensors set up. This is the one that was already in the garage. This is just like a cheapy cheap one from Amazon, Walmart, one of the Accurites. And these, I've always used these and they've worked wonderfully. They don't transmit to the phone. Like that's the only thing. They do have models though that I think run on Wi-Fi. But I like to have these around. You can't see anything that's on that screen. And you probably can't see what's on this one either. Can you? Is that gonna show? So the whole point is I'm getting different results across the board with all of these. I'm actually happy to have this here and there. I took screenshots because I have a whole house humidifier that's supposed to keep it at 45%. And I told the HVAC people last time they were here that the air seemed really dry and I didn't think it was working. And they're like, no, it's working fine. It, but no, it's not. I got three different things here saying that it's, that's not that big of a deal. The main point was that I'm getting different readings from all of these sensors. These two are closer than this one. Doesn't matter, I'll give it a while, see what happens. Cause it was just outside. There was one other thing I wanted to make sure I got in camera before I go outside and start working on plant things is the leaf that's opening up here on the Glorios. And the one that I said is probably gonna be like the first pancake cause it was so big during shipping. But we will see. It should be open by the end of the week, which will be when this vlog comes out. I was thinking that it might be kind of fun, a little interesting to go through and do not necessarily a plant tour. Well, I guess a plant tour. Just walk around, look at the plants. I really haven't given any updates specifically on anything since I brought everything in. And even when I brought everything in, I didn't spend much time just like going through the specific plants. It was more of just, here's a broad look. I don't think I could do this and show like absolutely everything individually, it, that would end up taking a really, really, really long time. But overall, you just kind of go through things and see what's working, what isn't working. You know, I had talked about how I really didn't do much of anything out here pretty much the entire month of December. And um, so th there are some plants that were, that's more evident. Made sure to not let anything die, but I just wasn't like babying things the way I normally would. And I'm looking at my plant shelves right now and I can already see a couple of plants that are looking very, very, very thirsty. So I can tackle that over <laughs> here. This is one of my Vanda orchids. I ordered a few from Moats back in Moats orchids, back, I don't know, November? I believe, maybe it was sometime in December, early December, and they don't come with hangers, which I did, come on Moats, why not? Everybody hangs their Vandas up, so that's like, that's something that irks me a little bit. 
and I was being cheap and didn't feel like ordering any, so they're hanging up on fishing line. It isn't really working out very well for this one. I mean, look, that looks dumb. That's not going well, but the plant itself is happy. It has a nice spike on it. It's gonna be a little bit hard to see because of the reflection. This is a Robert's Delight cross with Mimi Palmer. The flowers on this one are like a pretty purple and white with some tessellation and some speckles in it. It's supposed to be a pretty one. We don't have to go through all the orchids I got, but I was just pointing out that I hung them up and didn't work on all of them. This one right here though, looks okay. That fishing line thing worked for that one. Did find some hangers laying around, so I'll go ahead and get that fixed up because like I said, I mean, that's that's not gonna work. That looks pretty dumb. Still doing its thing though with some new roots. New, no, okay. I made it worse. Oh, that's all right. Can't always be perfect. The Dracaena Draco, Dragon's Dracaena over here is doing okay. I was a little bit apprehensive about even keeping this one out here because it's just, it's such a moist area and uh, they can take things a little bit on the drier side when temperatures are cool. And I hadn't had this place warmed up very much until recently. It was like in the upper 50s and 60s. You have temperatures that low, which these can take a little bit of cold, but when it's that low and things aren't warm, then you can have some issues with root rot. So I made sure to keep this plant on the drier side. But it does still need some cleaning, so you can see. Need to come in here and get all those leaf bases cleaned out. This is nothing unusual. Any Draco I've had, I usually about once or twice a year have to come in and clean out the old leaves that are in there. It's very satisfying. Look at how beautiful the fresh trunks look on there. And as they grow and swell, they get even more smooth. It's like something, like almost like a cartoon you can't see that. That color is totally normal when pulling the leaves off. It will turn back to this nice smooth gray color fairly soon, within a week or two. Yeah, like I said though, this is just kind of normal maintenance with these guys, at least in my experience. This trunk, this is actually recovered fairly well. When I bought this, I probably shouldn't have bought it in the first place, but when I got it, it had a section of trunk on here, if you can see that looked kind of scary, kind of rough. You see that? It had a little bit of mush in there. And I went in and I cut any of the mushy parts out and I dabbed some cinnamon powder in there. And it's calloused off and looks a lot better now. I don't know what happened there. That's just the way it was when I got it. And like I said, so I probably shouldn't have gotten it just because of that alone. But the nursery had had it for such a long time, like at least a year and I had wanted a new one because I had one of these years ago, a long, long, long time ago. I was probably a teenager. It was one of my favorite houseplants that I'd ever had. And at the time, they were like 30 bucks, something like that. And eventually it got kind of big and, uh, you know, I got sort of bored with it and just let it go. I let someone else have it. And then, you know, here I am 13, 14 years later and had been thinking about how much I missed that plant, mostly just because of the trunks. I absolutely, and already talked about it, but I just think they have the coolest trunks on them. As these grow and mature, that's going to get even more thick and plump and like that fun succulenty kind of look to it. Just very nice and unusual. Not typically what you see with most of Dracaenas that we grow inside. Usually they either have a really hard woody trunk or you're going to have the ones that are more sectioned off, almost like a stalk of bamboo, which are both really pretty but this is just something fun and different. Anyway, so the plant was kind of, in, not kind of, it was an impulse buy, even though it was something I'd wanted for a really long time. One of the few plants that I have that I've considered like the cancer purchases because I was like, you know what? I was, yeah, I was going through those motions of I could be dead any day now. Let me go ahead and get this plant that I've wanted for a year. I don't know, some people buy sports cars with their little life crises, I buy plants. Anyways, whole point there, probably shouldn't have bought it because I knew that it had that scabby, weird, rotty stuff on the trunk, but what can you do? I had a moment, what can I say? Okay, one thing I have noticed on a bunch of the plants is that it does look like there might be some nitrogen deficiency going on. Things are not quite as green as I'd like them to be. There's some spotting, though that could be all kinds of things. But, you know, when you have the plants outside part of the year, it becomes a little bit more difficult to break down where the spots are coming from. Usually it's just bugs chewing on the plants. Sometimes it can be a deficiency. That's usually what it is. Uh, it could be viral, bacterial, fungal, any of those things. That's why generally across the board, I just kind of treat things with a broad spectrum just to be safe. But all the new growth has been coming out totally fine on these. Just not quite as green as it really should be. So I haven't really done 
anything as far as fertilizing is concerned. I maybe, maybe did one fertilizing so far, but I honestly can't remember. So if I did, it was a while ago. But the temperatures were cooler in here, and I don't tend to fertilize unless it's warm and things are actively growing. The temperatures are just now starting to bounce back up. I was actually thinking with this Dracaena that's back here, I should probably move this into the house. I just don't really have a spot that I think it would look that great in. Here's the toxicity to take into account. You know, the cats, they absolutely love these stringy tips that are on these plants and they will eat those right up. It'll like, it's not necessarily something that's going to kill them, but every animal's different. Everybody's body is different. So can't really predict the reaction. Typically they would just chew it and then throw it up. I still would prefer to not have that happen, you know? That's just not ideal. Ideal for the plant, but even more so for the pets. I don't want them getting sick and throwing up around the house. So if I were to take this in, I would go through some scissors and make some cuts for any leaves that hang down low enough that they could get to them. It would be ideal to just wait a couple of years till the plant's tall enough and I wouldn't have to worry about that anymore. The thing is, I really need this spot for my Bismarck palm. It's still over there on the cool side and it really, it needs to get over here because now that this is up, this, this is, you can't, there's no transparency here completely opaque so in years past I had my plants on the cool side of the garage but they still got light from everything over here but now it's just pitch black over there so I have to do some rearranging with the stuff over there and get them moved around figure some other things out as far as all that's concerned and maybe put this in my house somewhere and do some trimming on it so the cats can't get to it because these make excellent house plants it's a really easy thing to keep indoors there's usually some issues with some brown tips, but I'm even having those issues out here. It's not bad enough to the point where it's a concern, so I don't care about that. I just, you know, every square foot that's out here is pretty valuable because I need to be able to put the plants there. And if there's a plant out here taking up space that doesn't need to be in this space, then it shouldn't be, right? Might as well free up the area for something that would do better over here. Because like the Bismarck palm, that's not going to do well in the house. They need a good amount of light and it's not that's not going to happen in the home and not in my house. I don't have the windows for them. I think that it would do a lot better in here. And this is really the only spot that it could go. So I'm gonna have to do some reconfiguring. I could always take the Dracaena and scoot it back further down this wall, down here closer to the Croton, which probably isn't going to want to focus. So you can kind of see what's back there. The concern I have there is that sometimes when I'm watering, I just kind of do some overhead sprays and if it's not warm out here and water collects in the center there, then there could be issues with rot. Yeah, so why risk it, right? Anyways, that's enough. this plant's gotten more than enough attention. Let's move on. Speaking of the Croton though, doing very, very well. You know, back in, what was it, November-ish, whenever I was moving the plants in, there was a lot of leaf drop on this plant because I really just... I didn't take the time to harden it off like I really should have. It rained all of October and I just didn't get around to it. It was one of those things where I was like, okay, this is a plant where I know that it's going to drop leaves regardless of what I do. It's just how much can I reduce it when they're hardened off properly? They only lose a few, not at all. Sometimes they'll lose all of them, but as long as they get the light and the warmth, they re-sprout and within maybe a month or so. So I was, that was one of those plants where I said, you know what? I'm just gonna let it do its thing. If the leaves are gonna fall off, they'll fall off. They'll grow back, and it did. It got some bare spots in it, but it's already filling back out and looking really good. It seems really happy so far. Some of the leaves are a little bit dull. Actually, that's kind of a thing on a bunch of the plants out here. That was something I meant to mention with some of the spots that were on this Dracaena here. Uh, when I did my spray, a really heavy spray before I brought things in, there were some plants that did not respond all that well to the dilution of the neem and the soap that I was using. Plants like this hibiscus here, it almost completely defoliated within 24 hours of being sprayed down. I just, I had the concentration up way, way, way too high. So that led to some spots on some things. So that was an oopsie. I had mixed up the dilution for my areca palm, which needs like a pretty heavy, potent spray. It gets really bad mealybug infestation. And I just completely forgot to dilute that after spraying the areca palm and then went on and sprayed everything else. But really, it's, it, the only damage it did was to a couple of the hibiscus, but they're okay. With these, I'm going to come in here with some clippers and give them a heavy prune. I usually do that this time of year anyways. I'll give them to flush back out with some new growth 
and drop the old stuff and have better branching for next year so they'll have better flowers for next year too. And then it brought out some spots in some of the other plants. But it's okay, because like I said, it didn't kill anything. It was just another oopsie moment. Had a lot of those <laughs> over the last year out here. Sometimes we get really comfortable with our plants and our routines and then get a little bit careless just because the routines become so monotonous and you get used to things. And forget to pay attention to the little details that are really important details. And <laughs> it's hard to see but the freckles croton is right behind the monstera leaf there. It's doing really well. I always like to give updates on that one. It's the one, I think this is one of the reasons I don't usually do like plant tours during the winter. It's because it's kind of hard to get around in here and actually show everything and get up close to them. That looks terrible. <laughs> Gotta fix that. So, you know, for some of the plants, just kind of have to look at them from a distance. I hope that's okay. Like I can get up close to them, but with the camera, my camera is kind of big and bulky. Not always an option. I don't like to reach across the water if I don't have to. For the most part, y'all get to see what's going on out here every single weekend. I just don't go like specifically onto like individual plants. On that note, the Philodendron Prince of Orange. I get asked about this one an awful lot. Great plant. Absolutely love it. I've had this one for, I don't know, a couple of years and it really 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 needs a repot you might be able to see from here that stem on there like it's come up and twisted and going around it could use a new pot with some fresh soil so that's going to be on my list for the springtime there's actually several plants that are on the repot list for the spring it's mostly hibiscus but that's a big one and then my my poor oncidium back here this sherry baby which doesn't like the camera apparently it isn't doing great back there it's it almost died last summer you know i had the other people taking care of my plants for me and a lot of the orchids yeah they didn't do very well this one like just barely made it but it's hanging on by a thread i think that it would probably be a good idea to go ahead and move that right and get it someplace where i can give it a little bit more tlc because the things around that shelf back there tend to be plants that are usually fairly fuss free or plants that don't want a lot of water so I need them to be further away from me so I don't smother them and overwater them and that's one that I think would do better where I can water it a little bit more frequently than I am right now like the colocasia that's back there they love water but when they're inside not as much growing colocasias indoors so 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 very different from growing them outdoors you know if this were outside and it were warm be drenching that thing with water pretty much every single day in here during the winter time even when it's warm I still that only gets watered about every 10 days something like that on the note of plants that like a lot of water and probably shouldn't be back there this bromeliad I cannot remember for the life of me what the variety name is on this one so I'm sorry it's another thing I've had people ask me about what I can tell you is that it's not the easiest bromeliad to grow. It's one that I have noticed is extremely temperamental. When things shift around and change too much, it throws a fit. It likes it warm and humid. Did great over the summer. Inside, it's been on the struggle bus. Isn't that kind of just the case for, is this just gonna be a video of me talking about how I'm killing my plants? I hope not, but you know, hopefully it's relatable. But that's the ultimate goal here, is walk around and talk about the plants and see how things aren't always perfect. That's okay. Have some succulents hanging up here. This is the burrow's tail, which has done a considerable, a considerable amount of growing since the last time I showed it, or well, since I did the video on it. It's dangling down all the way down here. Been a happy plant. This one, I have another burrow's tail. These are plants that I had to hide from my helpers over the summer because it was a little bit difficult to get them to understand that there are some plants that like just shouldn't be watered and this was one of them so I went ahead and I tucked it behind my tiki bar where they wouldn't even see it and it did okay I there is one point during the summer where it looked like it had some scorch on it maybe that was my other one yeah I think that was this one so you can maybe kind of see how this one it got a little bit too dry there was some shriveling going on in there and it had some sun scorch but I think the majority of those little leaves have fallen off by now. So this is one that I think I'm going to go ahead and actually water this one today. I'm just going to do it very, very, very carefully because it is, it's too dry. See how it's lifted up from the side of the pot? 
that's a problem. It's really hard to rehydrate them when they get to that point, and rehydrating them to a point where that soil is going to spread back out will potentially kill it. So instead, when they get like this, I use a dropper, and I just very slowly, very, very, very slowly, I'll get the water down into that soil without it coming in contact with any of the foliage that's here. So just a little bit of water, and then usually a few days later, I'll come back and give it a proper watering. That's the only disadvantage to having the plants hanging up like 10 feet up in the air, maybe nine feet up in the air, is it can be tricky sometimes to see how well the soil's doing. I can look at the leaves and tell just fine whether or not they need to be watered. The burrow's tail, they'll shrivel just a little bit, and it's better to water them right before they get to that point. Sometimes that's just what happens, right? I know to just go ahead and give it just a little squirt of water, but that's it. I have the stapilia up here, or the hernia zebrina. Kind of dark and hard to see, but there's not much to look at right now. It doesn't have any flowers on it. That tail cactus is doing very, very well. It's a whole bunch of new growth popping out from the top of the pot. Again, another cactus that I really haven't done much with, kind of like with the burrow's tail. They're just hanging out up here. There is a grow light up here in this Ikea light fixture. It's off right now because I was just trying to preserve a little bit of electricity so I could turn some more lights on while we walk around and talk about the plants. Don't want to trip my breakers. But usually that's on for about 12 hours a day. And that comes down onto these cactus and succulents that are hanging right here. And I have to say, I have really enjoyed this grow light. Have you guys tried these? This one's from uh, CNC. CNC, Sansai. That's the bulbs I'm using for the most part out here are all from that company. And the plants that I've had underneath this one have done surprisingly well. I wasn't sure because of just the different design style and uh, they're smaller LED chips essentially. So there's more of them, but they're less wattage. So they're not as powerful. They don't have as far of a spread as far as the distance from the light to the plant goes is what I mean. The to essentially it's kind of the par value. Anyways, I was just saying I wasn't sure how I was going to like it because of that, but everything I've had underneath it has done really, really well so far. I'm gonna go ahead and squirt a little bit of water down in there just to kind of get that process started. Poor thing, so thirsty. The shelves, so I just said that I usually keep plants back there that don't need much water, but they benefit from having that humidity around them. I was thinking about changing that up this year though, because I have tons and tons of this wicking cord here and it would be so easy to have some more moisture loving plants up there just have those cords dangling down to the water so i may do that and i could keep for the most part what's up there pull the orchid i'll probably run a cord here to this bromeliad which i don't i've never done the self-watering thing with bromeliads but it is one that just it the mix that it's in dries way 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 too fast and uh, as soon as it dries, the plant just goes It's really, it's not a tolerant plant at all. It's not one of my favorites. It looks cool, but I haven't been enjoying it as much as I do a lot of other bromeliads. Sometimes that's just the way it goes with plants though, right? We kind of have to adjust to them, find the sweet spot when it's one that we're not used to growing. And it doesn't help that the plant doesn't have a label. So it's really difficult to look up what the plant wants. At one point I knew what it was and I thought I had a screenshot in my phone and I just, I can't find it. But I'm also one of those people who I have like 3000 different things in my screenshot folder because I never go through and clean it out. So it could still be there. Uh, point being, you can't look it up. It makes it harder to remember what it is specifically that you need to do for the plant. And for the most part, what I found is to keep it warm and moist. And that hasn't been the case out here until recently. It's fine now, but the last, like month and a half not so much so maybe the wicking cord for this bromeliad here we will see because they don't feed from the roots at least not very much however they still shouldn't have a dry media around those roots there still needs to be moisture there so maybe since it's right above the water the oncidium's going to go i'm gonna, going to pull that plant maybe i may end up putting the gloriosum up there we will see I don't know. I don't really want it to be that far out of reach, though. So the Gloriosum is probably going to end up over here, right along the edge of the water. Any plants like some humidity usually do pretty well right along this edge here, because, I mean, you can see. I mean, look at all that moisture. It's a nice humid area. The Anthuriums usually like it. The um, 
We'll talk about the lime tree in a minute. But another oopsie moment with that one. But again, this is a location right there along that wall where I could very easily just pull some of this wicking cord over just as a fail safe. Just really enjoyed how effective this was last year as far as having that fail safe for when I'm not doing what I'm supposed to be doing and staying on top of watering. I don't have specific watering days out here. That's, I did that like long, long time ago when I was first getting into plants, but the, you know, all the plants that need to be watered at the same time. It's just a matter of making sure to pay attention to everything and know that everything's gonna get the water that it needs, but then you can miss them when there's this many things piled in together. It's real easy to miss something. So for things that like a lot of moisture, that wicking cord might come in useful. The anthurium is on the list for a repot, but I'm not going to wait till spring. I'm probably going to do that soon. That's something I'm going to try and get done next week because it's really, it's just, it's outgrown this pot. It could use something, just a little bit more space. There isn't even very much media left in there. So I think that it would really enjoy it. I might just keep it in this pot right here that's just sitting in. I don't know, that might be a little bit too porous. It might dry out too fast. This is a plant I did some pruning on sometime in the last few weeks. This is one of the videos and uh, it, it's doing well. It's recovering nicely. All that yellow foliage that was there, some of that was from the cold, some of that may have been from the spray, though I was really careful about spraying anything that was epithetic. It just has like epithetic tendencies. I was more careful because their roots tend to be more delicate. Same thing with the ferns. But it has a bunch of new growth coming up, a flower, opening right there. So that was one thing I wasn't positive how the light was going to be over here this year because the Monstera had grown so, so, so much last summer that things over here are more shaded than they used to be. So I wasn't positive. I was a little on the fence if things were going to get enough light over here, particularly the Anthurium, because I've always had this right here. And it's always done really, really well in this spot. It generally grow and flower for me all winter long. I'm glad to see that it's still growing and still flowering. I did change out some of the grow bulbs with some that are a higher intensity, more of those sansy bulbs. Sansy, sansi, I don't know. Somehow enough light is getting down there for the anthurium, but I can't really say the same thing about the lime tree, which this is again, probably more of a my fault than anything else. Have you ever been watering your plants while you're like listening to music or texting on your phone? This one got a pretty heavy watering. It's in a clay pot and the soil like dried out very quickly. So I think that it's okay. I moved it from in the house to out here just to make some more room in my kitchen. I didn't really have room to have the lime tree in there and they don't really like to be moved. So I expected it to have some leaf drop in. <laughs> oh boy, it sure did. It dropped plenty of leaves, but it's also, it's putting up new flower buds at the same time. Not that big a deal. My uh, um, calamondins, oranges, lemons, kumquats, they've always done the same thing. If I take them from in the house to out here, they throw a fit. When I take them from outside to inside, they throw a bit of a fit. Whether I harden them off or not, they just don't seem to enjoy being moved. I don't know if that's just my climate or the time of year when those things happen. I don't know, but they're tough plants. I'm not concerned about it. It'll be fine. Oh, and the Deliciosa, the Monstera. That's really hard to see, isn't it? I don't spend a lot of time talking specifically about this plant. And I think that that's just because it's so big. It's in the background of everything. So it's, I don't usually think that it's something that's necessary to give frequent updates on. Oh, forgot, have a light out here. Oh, it helps a little, not much. It's been doing well. Yeah, I repotted this just a couple of months ago and not much has changed. It did open up one new leaf back there. I talked about that leaf when I was changing out these light bulbs a few weeks ago and then I was concerned that it might be too close to those bulbs, but so far it's been okay. I've been keeping a close eye on it to make sure that the cuticle doesn't start to go dull. The cuticle being the outermost part of the leaves. It's what protects them, what protects the pores of the plant. Where that shine and glossiness comes from and everything seems good it's still nice and shiny it's even its base is starting to swell which is going to be hard to see kind of so i think it's getting ready to push out a new leaf that's just an assumption because usually when those leaf bases when they start to start to bulk up and swell usually that means they're about to split open and put out some new growth so that's exciting not a plant that i've ever really had issues growing out here it's always done well whether it's a year where i keep things more on the cool side or if i go warmer I mean, if I go warmer, they tend to grow a lot <laughs> during the winter time. This year, I think I'm gonna keep things more in the middle just because it's less maintenance when it comes to pests and disease to not have things so hot that things are growing ferociously, which also means that the bugs are just abundant and everywhere. 
I don't have anything out here that's just going to blech, drop dead as soon as things get cool and wet. When I say cool and wet, I mean like below 65. So I'm aiming this year for between 65 and 75. In years past, I have pushed things well into the 80s, and the plants have loved what I've done that. But that is so much more work for myself as far as just the overall maintenance of everything. And I wouldn't mind having a winter time where you just kind of chill with the plants and let them just hang out, relax for the winter time, and they can do their growing thing when I move them outside in the spring and in the summertime. Don't get me wrong, I'm still going to keep things warm enough that there's some growth. They just don't need to be like exploding in growth like they have been in years past. And the orchids don't usually appreciate it when it's super, super hot out here if I don't have a good drop between night and day. And I always like to make sure that it shifts somewhat. It helps keep the plants a little bit more sturdy when it comes to getting them back outside. They don't have quite as much of a shock when they're used to there being fluctuations throughout the day. And uh, for the plants like the orchids, helps induce blooming. And I don't have a ton of orchids right now. I lost the majority of them summer of 2020 because you know, 2020. Not bothered or upset by having lost a bunch of the orchids. It's okay, I'm getting new ones starting over. It's totally fine. I'm really happy that the people who are helping me with everything were able to do what they did, which was, they, I mean, they kept the majority of the plants alive and did a great job but I wasn't expecting people who don't know orchids to like do wonderfully with them. There's just a slight learning curve, not extreme. I don't think it's any different than people who are growing all these crazy exotic aeroids. You're growing those and grow orchids, but I, I had people helping me who really, like they didn't know much about plants at all and they learned a lot, a lot about plants last summer. And they did a wonderful job considering. And the Monstera, it was just, it's tried and true self, just did its own thing kept it someplace where it was getting hit by the drip emitters that I had on sprayers. So it was like getting a mist from those about two or three times a day. So the area stayed really humid and it really, really, really appreciated that. So much growth. I've had people suggest me to go ahead and tie it up to let more light in down here. I thought about doing that. I just, I don't know. I like to let them do their natural thing and grow however they want to. I mean, I would like for it to <laughs> get attached to the pole so it's not so unruly, but with everything that's down here, I just think it would look kind of odd to pull up all those big leaves just because they're so big. Now, some of these are older growths, so they're smaller, and the growth that it puts out during the winter is always going to be smaller, but I just think that that would look kind of funky, having them tied up, and then I'd only be able to see them from the bottoms, which just still looks neat, seeing the light shine through those fenestrations, but eh, like I said, it's not the same. The tie, the Monstera here, this is one that I'm probably going to do an experiment with and put this onto self-watering cord also. Still going to have to water the plant plenty. It's a very, very, very thirsty plant. For me, the way I pot them, the mix that I use, they need to be watered more frequently because I pot them into a media that dries more quickly. Just to be safe, to avoid having to worry about root rot, I'd rather water them more frequently, but since it's been freshly repotted, and I bumped this up into a much, much, much larger pot than you would normally do for a house plant, I just thought it would be nice to not have to repot it for several years. So I just went big. I was like, let's just do it. Put in something big that's not gonna flop over because it's become so top heavy and just be very careful. Which is good anyways to be mindful with the plants, especially if they've been repotted recently, you know, for a few months afterwards, gotta keep a closer eye on them. If there are plants that are gonna be more prone to having moisture build up around the roots and that causing problems. But that's not gonna be a problem. Cause like I said, the mix that I use is drying out super, super fast. I used the coca bop, which I love. It's a coconut based soil. I added some bark to it. I did a whole video on it. You can watch that video if you want to know specifically what I did. A uh, great soil blend, coconut based and very, very, very airy. The aeroids have always enjoyed it. But yeah, I'm having to water this plant a ton. And I mean a ton. It's also a big plant, so that's not too surprising. But once this has established itself into the pot, I don't think that's going to be anywhere near as much of a problem. Just right now it has a smaller root mass and a bigger pot. And that's why the root rot is something I have to be very mindful of. The whole point here is just that I don't expect to see the same growth out of the plant this winter like I have in years past because it was just repotted just a couple of months ago. And these are one of those plants where I've noticed, at least that when you repot them, they kind of just slow down and chill out for a while. They're going to spend some time spreading their roots out, getting them to hit the sides of the pot and get things really developed down below. 
And then once they do that, then the growth explosion starts to happen again. Say explosion. The deliciosas aren't known to be one of the fastest growing plants, but I mean, this is, it's been growing pretty well for me the past few years. Though I've had it for several, and it wasn't until the last few years that it really started to take off. But with this, when it comes to the wicking cord, because I won't be able to put that underneath the pot, I don't know how I would even do that. It's not established into that pot, so laying it on its side could uproot the plant, cause a lot of problems if I were to do that. What I'm more likely to do, what I think I'll do, is take the wicking cord, the stuff right here, and you can just wrap that around PVC stakes, wooden stakes, whatever you want to use, just whatever you need to drive that down into the, I shouldn't make that motion. Just a spike essentially, so it can be driven down into the soil. And this pot would probably need four of those. Just coil that cord around there. I'll do it in a vlog and we can talk about it then, but it's quick, it's easy, and it's just an extra backup for if I forget to water one day, just because it's, the, it's not on my mind during the winter time to water like three times a week. That's not normal. Nothing else out here needs that. Like nothing. Even when things are really warm out here, I, it's been very rare. I'm not gonna say never, but it's been rare that I've had to water more than once or twice a week. Once a week is more typical. I'm trying to think because this video, this is gonna be a two, potentially even a three part video. It's cause there's so many plants out here to talk about. So uh, I'm trying to think just like what's on this side that I haven't, I haven't updated you guys on the bird's nest fern in a really long time. This one got repotted back in, uh, I don't know, May, something like that. I put this pumice on top of the soil, hoping that that would help reduce the snail issues. And let me tell you, that worked so well. I did not have a single snail on this fern this year, not one. Now the plant itself at some point when the seasons changed and the angle of the sun changed. It got some scorch on it and some burnt leaves. You can see there's some damage there from when the sun shifted and I didn't really realize that I needed to move the plant. But otherwise, it's been doing well. It hasn't been growing incredibly quickly, but I also, I haven't been like tending to it in the manner that would make a bird's nest fern grow quickly. You know, these are plants that are great because they can go more dry. They don't have to be in a really moist, humid environment. However, if you want to get really good growth out of them, having some warmth and humidity, that will get them growing so much more quickly. But what's nice is they can't just hang out in a more dry and arid environment. You still have to be careful to not let them dry out completely. So now that things are more humid out here, I think that it should start to pop out some new growth. It did open up some smaller fronds not too terribly long ago, but just not like what I would prefer to see. So this is one that I actually might relocate down to the edge of the pond when I do a little bit more rearranging out here because that's going to give it that moisture and consistency. And even there's actually a decent amount of airflow down here, not the same as up here. Everything up here that's on this line right here, this backdrop line gets a good amount of airflow, which I forgot to mention is that's also why I have the burrow's tail hanging up here, both of them, because the circulation fan is just, where is it? There it is. See it? So uh, they get a pretty good amount of airflow, which is excellent because that way I can water these. Still not very much because they don't want a ton of water in wintertime. Having them here keeps it a little bit safer from having to worry about rot. Can you even see that? I can't see my screen. My camera's up above my head. <laughs> I don't know. Hopefully you could. Bird's nest fern doing okay. I'd like to see it do better though. So I'm probably going to move it where I can water it more easily right here. Anything that's in this spot, I don't water too heavily because there's heaters right down there and I don't want to get electrocuted. So they have to be moved to be watered. So the bird's nest fern, if I want to grow more, I need to water it more. Probably a good idea to go ahead and move that plant, right? This is nifty for me because sometimes when you go through things and you just sort of say it out loud, it helps piece things together and help kind of get an idea of what needs to be done. I'm a big fan of making lists. That's always a nifty way to keep things organized, right? But there's just something about actually going through, looking at things specifically and having that train of thought helps me get a little bit more organized in my head as to what I need to get done and get checked off the list. And the other Monstera, I know it looks yellow. That's just the lighting. It's doing well here. This one I repotted, whoa, I don't even know. It was late last summer, I think. And it's been happy so far. It's got new growth coming out, not onto the support pole. So I'm gonna have to figure out a way to get back there. It's up there, it's pretty tall. So I'm gonna have to somehow get a ladder out and get in there so I can attach that to the side of the pole, but it's been happy. The new leaves that are coming out are small 
er than the ones that were growing over the summer, but that's, again, to be expected. I think I mentioned that when I was talking about the Deliciosa, the Thai, that when it's cooler, smaller leaves. Cooler, less humid, either of those things, or both. Generally smaller foliage, so I'm gonna get smaller leaves. So I'm not at all surprised by that, that the growth they put out while things were rather cool in here <laughs> during the month of December, those are gonna be smaller than what comes out throughout the rest of the year, really more so compared to what comes out during the summertime. That's when you get lots and lots of nice big leaves on them, particularly the Deliciosa. This guy back here, it gets some neat leaves on it, but it's still, it's nothing as impressive as these monsters over here. These are gigantic. I think that's about everything for this half of the growth space. I didn't really talk about the bromeliads back here. They're fine. They're neoregelias. Those are pretty tough. They're, two of them are fireballs. I can't remember what the other one is. They don't have a lot of color on them right now because they're not getting that intensity from the sun that gives them that bright color. But they're fine for giving plants, so I don't have much to be concerned with as far as they go. I think they need a little bit more water because they do look kind of dry right now, but it's also, I'm on kind of the tail end of my watering. So they'll be getting a pretty heavy watering sometime probably tomorrow. So it's a little bit late to do it now. So a good soak should help them out. As that humidity climbs in here, which it already, it's getting so much better already. But as things get more sticky, then they don't have to water the plants as much, which is awesome. I love that. I'm pretty sure I talked about the begonia last week's vlog, right? The dragon's wing. It's been growing so well over here. Even though it's a few feet, several feet from the grow lights up above it, it's still doing its thing, putting on its show with the flowers and looking nice. I was really expecting these flowers to get more pale. Generally the pink dragon's wings and the red dragon's wings, when these are grown inside, they have white flowers on them unless you can get them a good amount of light. But so far they're still pink and they've been in here for a few months. Usually if I do keep them flowering, they are white and nowhere near as colorful. The plant itself has some empty stems inside so it could probably use a prune but I'm enjoying the flowers so much right now that I just kind of want to leave it let it do its thing and enjoy having those in the background. It's nice having the pops of color in the flowers. There's something rewarding about flowers right? It's a marker that lets us know the plants are doing okay and especially when the flowers are consistent. Like the hibiscus usually they're flowering right about now this time of year for me but Eh, you saw them. They got sprayed a little bit too heavily. Really though, just giving those, the hibiscus, there's one over here, giving those their cut back that they usually would get this time of year anyways, that should flush them back out. I'm not too worried about those. Generally really tough plants. There have even been years with my hibiscus where they've almost completely defoliated and they just boop pop right back up as soon as things get bright and warm for them again. Of that, I love versatile, resilient plants, which I wouldn't necessarily, hibiscus is a house plant. They can be a pain in the butt, but I don't, these aren't normal household conditions out here. At least for me as a house plant, can be a pain in the butt. For house plants that need a lot of light, I don't really have any of those windows in my house. So pretty much the only things I can keep indoors are ones that can get by on more of a medium to low need. My uh, entryway to the house gets a good amount of light, but there's nowhere to put like a plant shelf or rack. It would just look weird. Hence what I'm, one of the many reasons everything's out here. I'm going to fix this. I swear. I promise. I'm going to fix that. I know the orchid's probably not happy like this, but I don't know. There's just something about this when I look at it. I'm like, yeah, this is relatable. All right. That's enough. That's this half of the grow space. I think there's still a, a cordolin back there. We'll talk about that next weekend for the part two uh, or maybe this up uh, next video the midweek video maybe we can just do the tour i don't know we'll see i have a lot of plants coming in the mail uh, all today plants i ordered like back in november for some reason i got a notification last night from four different places that they're all arriving today and then two more the next day so six and they're decent size um, packages that should be a lot of plants. So I'm going to be kind of focused on dealing with those and getting things moved around out here to make room for them, which shouldn't be that tricky. Actually, there should be enough room for everything. Some of them will be staying in the house. We'll talk about that when those plants come in. Oh, and well, I'll finish this up when I give an update on the Gloriosum, but probably give that a couple more days to open up. I mean, not a couple days for y'all. You'll see it in just a minute. And it's supposed to snow. That'll be nice. I really hope we get to see some snow. All right. Well, See what happens here in the future. That turned out to be a nice looking 
a leaf, a few blemishes here along the edge, but I'm not surprised by that. I, you may remember when I was on, I don't really unbox it, but when I first showed the plant, you could see that spear all curled and coiled up and you, there were some blemishes where it would probably been bruised during the shipping. So that was to be expected, not a big deal. And the humidity's also been a little bit low for the Gloriosum, as I've recently learned by the sensors that turned out to maybe be effective, maybe not, either way. They don't line up with what my actual thermostat says for the house, so good to be making some changes to my HVAC system, which is good. It's good to know that I need to have some repairs done and actually have some proof to show the HVAC people that my humidifier is not working like they say it is. I want to show more of it, but there are plants everywhere, so I kind of got to stay up close and hide it somewhat. The leaf needs to come up a little bit higher, but it should come up just a smidge higher over the next few days and start to darken up and... Well, it's just a new leaf. I don't really know how much time I can spend talking about that. Apparently about a minute. That's, that's really all I have to say. Look, new leaf. I don't typically jump for joy over a new leaf, but when something is new or it's just come in the mail, then I tend to like to watch out for like the first three or the ones I pay the most attention to. And after that, I know the plant has kind of established itself and become more comfortable in the home and don't have to worry about it quite as much. So there we have it. Looks good. Just like you, right, Toby? You look good too, Toby. Yes, you do. You a little bit of a food coma? You just had breakfast. Such a good boy, Toby. We <laughs> Such a funny dog. Yes, you're a good boy too, buddy. I was gonna try and find Pumpkin because she wasn't really in this video. But I don't have any idea where she is. She's off somewhere being a cat, having some sleep, got some snow. Not very much, but I'll take it. Any snow is better than just looking at brown. Oh, it all melted. Okay. When I got up this morning, there was snow all over these hills and up in the trees. Oh, well, what can you do? There's still time for more. Toby, you like the snow, don't you, Toby? Why are you acting like you did something? I know you didn't do anything. You're too good. Yes, you are. You good boy. All right, that's going to do it. I will get to the other half of the grow space next week. It's a lot of shelves with oh, all those tiny little plants. I'm just like, I feel like I'll end up talking too much about that or it's going to take a really long time because there's a lot more work that needs to be done as I go through those plants. A lot of repotting and the like things I'm going to be putting on wicking cords and some things that I'm going to decide if I want to keep them or not because I kind of just brought everything in. Not everything but I brought a lot of stuff in and decided I would go through some things later that I maybe like I'm just not too keen on anymore. So we'll do that next week or in a few days. I don't know. Anyways I hope everybody's doing well. Having a great day and a great life and everything's just going beautifully for you. Comment down below. Say hi. I love talking to everybody. Having fun with your plants right now? Anyways, as always, and most importantly, everybody, keep on growing. Bye! Bye!